Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's Wine, Women, and Words. Joining me tonight, of course, is Michelle. Hello. And our special guest this week is Acer Salmon. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. I know. I've been so excited to get you on the show to talk about the book in depth because I got to hear a little bit about it and hear from it at Boca de Oro, and it's just such a neat book, and Thank in you. my opinion, because it's not something that we regularly hear about, and there's just this really great wave of Middle Eastern female authors hitting the market this year, and I'm, I'm enjoying all of it. I'm reading as many of them as I can, and so can you tell people about your book and also do the title, because the title's kind of long. And I'm afraid I'm going to mess it up. <laughs> uh, it's called The Wrong End of the Table, A and watch me mess it up. It's my own title. A mostly comic memoir of an Arab-American woman just trying to fit it. There, I got it. Um, I, I can do the disclaimer and say that there's been some wine in this, but still, even if I didn't have wine, I think I'd still kind of mess it up because it, it is long. But it, it, that's pretty much what it is. When people say, mm -hmm. describe your book in 20 words or less, I don't know how many words that is, but <laughs> that, that, you know, I'm like, okay, how many words do I have left? Um, it is basically the story, I, I'm from Iraq and I, well, I was born in Iraq. I, we moved to Kentucky when I was four, lived there for a bit and then I moved to Saudi Arabia for a, a spell and then moved back to Kentucky. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, I feel like that has given me some interesting things to talk about. and. With everything that's been going on right now, you know, with with the other quote unquote, um, you know, taking center stage when the whole, you know, when, when Trump happened and all that, I always say he happened, but um, it's it's kind of brought the other and what it means to be the other into mm -hmm. the forefront. And by that, I mean not just being an immigrant. I mean, it, my book is about being an immigrant, but it's really about not fitting in. It's mm -hmm. about you know, having this feeling of feeling it that you're always at the wrong end of the table, that the, that no matter where you are, something more interesting is happening, you know, at the other end. And I feel like, you know, in, in a way, I kind of feel like I own, I, I own that claim because I'm an immigrant, but as I'm fine, as I was fine, as I found out uh, pretty quickly when I was writing the book and sharing it with people, it's not just, you know, I, I can't just claim that because being an immigrant, I think everybody feels that way. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's, it's just about being an outsider, a fish out of water. Um, and just really my story, you know, kind of a, a comedic look at navigating the waters and finding my true, uh, true identity or authentic authenticity rather. Gotcha. And when you first moved out to the U S it was first, it was to Ohio. Right. And then, it, then Saudi Arabia and then Kentucky. No. and then moved to Kentucky briefly, and then moved to Saudi Arabia. And then Kentucky became our home base. So I consider Kentucky to be my hometown. Okay. If you will, uh, Lexington. Um, I don't know why Ohio. Um, I think it's just because there were, you know, when, when any immigrant group, and specifically Arabs move, they move to be with their people. And so mm -hmm. probably we had friends in Ohio. And, you know, so they, they brought us over there and then, you know, pretty soon, I think, we went to Kentucky because the there was a, a my parents are pharmacists and the College of Pharmacy is, is big in in Kentucky. Okay. So a little bit more information than probably you needed, but <laughs> <laughs> but that's interesting. I would not think that the biggest that the College of Pharmacy the place to go is Kentucky. You, yeah, so they have a that, good, yeah. yeah, they have a good good school out there. Mm -hmm. And also, I think my parents were like, what's the furthest we can get from from Iraq? We want to do the opposite. Let's just go there. <laughs> about bourbon. I don't know. No, I'm joking. <laughs> they didn't hear about the bourbon. <laughs> well, it's, um, it's really interesting, you know, just the, the whole experience of being kind of the outsider. Um, I completely, you know, separate or different situation. But when I was a kid, we moved from California to Switzerland. Oh my goodness. Um, and I mean, it, it wasn't a huge culture shock. I mean, nowhere near moving from the Middle East to, right. you know, Kentucky. Um, but it was definitely a culture shock and I was definitely the outsider, literally the only American in the entire school. Mm -hmm. Um, so I can definitely relate to it, but I love that, you know, the situations that you go through when you're 
you know, the other person or, or the, the new person or the strange, you know, the different one, um, you have to laugh at some of them. <laughs> Otherwise, yes, they can drive you crazy. Right. So I, I love that, you know, you took it, you put a comedic spin on it because really, you know, it, it ha you have to laugh at it. Right. Well, I mean, and that's the thing is, is uh, yes, I laugh at it now. Back then, mm -hmm. it, I wasn't laughing back then. That's true. I think, I think the thing is that I always had this, it gets better, you know, it's, oh, it's going to be fine. You know, these kids don't understand. I think because my parents were, um, I feel like the reason why maybe I didn't fit in as, as well as I could have given being an immigrant is my parents were also trying to fit in. And so they didn't tell, they never sat me down and said, oh, well, this is what happens here. You know, just, just get through it. You're, you know, you're going to get to middle school. It's going to be a little hard when you get to high school, it's going to be a little hard. But when I went in high school, you know, da, 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 this and that it was, they were, they were as new as I was. My mother and I learned, were learning English at the same time. But I think there was always this kind of, ah, you know, they don't get it. It's okay. You know, just, you have to be understanding with, with people. And I think in a way it kind of, I was, it pissed me off. Can I say pissed me off? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> It pissed me off because I was like, well, damn it, you know, like I don't, you know, I, I, I want to be able to fit in, but at the same time, it, my, my, it kind of gave me this sense of, okay, you have to understand where people are coming from. Mm -hmm. In other words, like I was here and I want, I, it felt like I was in, in a new world and people were, you know, talking weird, but they were telling me I was talking weird. And my parents were like, well, yeah, but you know what, you have to understand, you know, not everybody's the same. And so in that regard, they really instilled in me this, 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 you know, being able to appreciate differences. And that kind of helped me feel a little bit less, you know, like an outsider. But I kind of I do wish that, you know, had they been more, you know, ready to assimilate themselves, I think, a lot of the the stuff, you know, that you know, when you're a kid, you want the the stuff that kids have, like Barbie dolls. I never mm -hmm. had Barbie dolls. My mom would get me these giant, like, cheap, like, I, they were the kinds you get in fairs. You know, the, they were this big, mm -hmm. and they were, <laughs> but she was like, these are better than Barbie dolls. And I'm like, no, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> like, my friends were like, oh, your mom is such a feminist. I'm like, no, 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 no. She wasn't a feminist. She just just was like, no, I'm not getting you a Barbie doll here. This is just as good. I'm going to get you this. It's, it's, it's so, um, but wow. So California to Switzerland, that's fascinating. It that's was, really I, I remember I was 10, I think when we moved and my first questions that I can remember were <laughs> in my 10 year old mind, do they have electricity? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, do I have to wear later hosen? <laughs> Those were, did, they're about the I, I was very <laughs> pleased to find out that yes, they had electricity and indoor plumbing and all the modern conveniences of life. Mm -hmm. And that no, I did not have to wear later hosen. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's so glamorous though. You, come, you came back to the States and probably all everybody was like, Ooh, that's the girl from Switzerland. It's so good. Anime. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> then I was the, the, the new girl from, from Europe and had right. this air of, you know, mystery. Yeah. Did you like that or did you hate that at the time? Um, coming back, I liked it because I was going into my freshman year of high school. So oh, okay. I could have used, you know, I, I appreciated the boost. Right. Um, the cred, and, the street cred. Exactly. <laughs> uh, in Switzerland, it, they, we lived, our first year we lived in a village, like Ooh. literally um, on top of a mountain where you had to take a train three hours to get to like a big shopping center. Um, and it was very, since Switzerland is such a small country, they're very protective of their identity. And it may be different now, but at the time they didn't like people coming and staying. They liked people coming and visiting, but they didn't want you to stay. <laughs> um, so we had some some problems, and my mom was learning Italian or in German along with me. You know, we would practice, and and I'll go, no, mom, you're, that's not how you say it. You're doing it wrong. Yeah, um, that's so cool to me. So yeah, so I can definitely relate to probably a good portion of of what you experienced just in on a different continent. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, see, for me, I wish I wanted to be Italian. I wanted to be something that people knew about. I didn't like, mm -hmm. you know, I also came back junior year and I came from Saudi Arabia and I had an all girl school situation. My hair, I had a disastrous haircut. Do you remember? Okay, this isn't why it was disastrous, but you remember Three's Company, Janet? Remember the short? <laughs> yeah. the oh my girl? God, you had Janet's hair, you poor thing. I had, yeah, I had Janet's hair, but not only that, I didn't understand that bangs shrunk up. So I said, oh, no. cut him to here. And, he, you know, I was 14. I had pimples. You know, I hadn't grown. You know, you don't grow it into your nose and all that stuff. Uh -huh. And it's because my mother, I blame my mother. I blame my mother for everything. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, she wouldn't let, I had long hair. And she said, you're not going to cut it. It's so beautiful. Don't cut your hair. Don't cut your hair. I think when I was 14, she goes, okay, fine. You can cut your hair. So it was down to here. And I just took and like lopped it all off. And I did the same thing. Did you? Yeah. yeah. Because your mom told you, like, did she say you couldn't cut it? Yeah, I wasn't allowed to cut it. It was this whole huge thing yeah. that I would fight with her for for most of my childhood. And it was long. It was down to my waist wow. long. Wow. And I have really, really thick hair. Mm -hmm. And it was just, it was awful for me to take care of. I remember having a knot about, like, this size cool. in the back of my head, like right in the nape of my neck because I was a kid. Yeah, yeah. So I couldn't, I didn't brush my hair right. And I got this knot for me. I remember sitting in my aunt's kitchen crying as my cousins are trying to untangle the knot for me. And my aunt bitching at my mother about letting my hair be so long. And it wasn't until I was, I was 14 and I got, and I came out to California cause I come out to California to visit my dad and I got the Heather Locklear cut. Ooh, and okay. my stepmom took me to get my hair cut. She got permission from my mother in writing that it was okay to do. <laughs> and my stepmom took me to go get my first like real like teenager oh. haircut. And then after that, it progressively got shorter for a while. Oh, really? But it was yeah, good. Yeah. It was a good haircut though, right? Yeah, the first one was a good one. Yeah. After that, I, I did the subsequent yeah. really weird short pixie cuts. <laughs> yeah, mine. Um, I was in. I came to Kentucky, and I was awkward around boys. And this was before it was cool. They thought I was a lesbian, and like now it's cool to be a lesbian. I don't, I mean, back then mm -hmm. in Kentucky, it was not cool. It was just you know they're like, oh, she's she's a lesbian, you know. And it was, <laughs> um, yeah, it was just this like uh, every sort of awkward, and mm -hmm. and you know not having somebody to tell me it's okay, it's cool. I think I just amplified the awkwardness because I'm looking at pictures of myself when I was in high school. And I, in hindsight, I don't appear as geeky and awkward as I thought I was. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when you're there and you just want to fit in, like I wanted to have the Heather Locklear. I wanted the long hair. I wanted the, actually, I wanted um, Nellie from uh, The Last of the Prairie. I wanted those little curls. Mm -hmm. For some reason, <laughs> I don't know why. I just thought they were great. And couldn't have it because Middle Eastern hair, you know. So, um yeah, so just whatever. So yeah, so I was like, okay, <laughs> maybe one day this will be funny, but it shouldn't <laughs> was back then. I hated, it. I hated everything. <laughs> and so you went through a lot of this as a child. So dealing with this as amplified with the kids stuff was was there bullying from other kids at all? In addition to just not fitting in. I mean, you know, just minor bullying. I guess mm -hmm. I didn't. Again, I didn't. It, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know, I didn't know how to identify it as bullying, but it was, you know, they make fun of my name, Ace or Eraser, they call me Ace or Razor, you're going to shave your butt tonight, you know, like all that oh stuff. Oh my gosh. Second, you know, in second grade. That's the, but that's the thing, like I, it turns out, and I've been talking to people that everybody had got bullied in second mm -hmm. grade, no matter what their name was, you know, it can be, you can have... I forget what my, my one friend had a pretty normal name and they made up some stuff because kids are the worst. Kids uh -huh. are jerks. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, so I didn't really, yeah, it wasn't really, um, I think, you know what it was though also is that once I got my first taste of bullying, I said, I'm not, go I'm not going to put myself out there. So I made fun of myself. So mm -hmm. I became a class clown or I tried to be as much as I could. I mean, I, I wasn't, I didn't like the limelight. So I was, re I was really shy. But I felt like if I made fun of myself, then people couldn't make fun of me. Mm -hmm. And so I think that kind of put that, you know, put that at bay um, mm -hmm. a little bit. See, that's smart. <laughs> it's self-preservation. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Michelle, I think I cut you off. Didn't you have a oh. question? Um, I was just going to ask, 
when what was it like to you know, revisit that as an adult when you're you know putting all of it down on, onto paper and writing your story to kind of relive it now from you know from an adult's point of view and now you can laugh at it mm -hmm. you know a lot of it was I, a lot of it i'd remembered and um so it it was interesting because you know, it was it was so horrific to me back then but then as an adult i thought oh i'm being dramatic you know and this is you know i need to maybe i need to make this a little funnier um as i was writing it i found that um you know as i was writing it and talking to people about it they were also sharing their stories with me and so it it kind of it, it helped kind of boy me if you will boy b o u b u o <laughs> not boy like boy and girl. Boy, yeah. <laughs> it's the water speaking. No, um, <laughs> yeah, because we're what? for drinking water on this show. <laughs> we turned it, yes. Um, well, wine has water in it, but um, it was, you know, what it, it, it was. In, it was interesting. Um, I think as I as I was writing the book and finding the narrative that you know ha having to find as I was writing it, the narrative sort of developed from it through it rather. And what was surprising to me was more kind of the stuff in the middle. There was a lot of stuff once I reached college. So I was definitely an outsider when I was younger. And then, you know, there was obviously the 9-11 after 9-11. Mm -hmm. There was that. And then, oh, the Iraq war before that, because I'm from Iraq. And, you know, now people were interested in where Iraq was and they wanted to know. And it was all about bombing them. And so there was a little bit of, you know, it was a lot of a little bit of angst in that period. But then there was this period where I was, I'd gone to college and I suddenly fit in and I was not the most interesting person or exotic person or, you know, we, I was not the one with the weirdest name. And it was this interesting realm where I was looking at it and going, oh, actually I do present as white. I have this weird, I have this privilege in a sense. I had a roommate who was African-American and we had, had these conversations where you know, she didn't have that luxury. And it was, and I, and I never really thought about it because I always thought about it as me being an outsider of America versus Americans. And it's really only recently um, in the last, you know, when I started writing the book in 2016 or um, when the women's March was, well, after Trump was elected, mm -hmm. that it became this, this, you know, this thing where intersectionality took center stage and it wasn't. And so, I think as I was writing everything, looking back at it and going, oh, okay. You know, had I known all of that stuff, like the intersectionality, had I had I been aware of that concept, I think it would have changed a lot of things. I think, well, I, I don't know if I would have had the book to write because I would have felt like I fit in because I would have mm -hmm. felt like, oh, you're, it's okay. You can, you're allowed to be angry because of X, Y, and Z. You're allowed to feel like, you know, you're, um, you know, feel like an outsider or whatever. But when I was growing up, I always felt like I couldn't because I thought people would say, oh, you're being dramatic. Come on. I mean, look at you. You know, you don't have an accent. You know what I mean? Like there's always something, I don't know how to explain it other than there was always something that was quite, not quite right. But, you know, I could, you, you look at me and you, you wouldn't, you know, you, I could be Mary or something. You know what I mean? Like I could be you wouldn't know that I was, a lot of my friends didn't know that I was from Iraq, but I felt it on the inside mm -hmm. and it had been so drilled into me um, that it was this, it's this like bubbling on the inside, this, this, these feelings. And, um, you know, nowadays it's, it's especially right now, it's like this sort of anything goes. And I feel like I'm, I feel like I over, over answered your question, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. I hope I, I, hope I answered it. But <laughs> yes, to answer your question, it was, it did feel like, it was it was odd to revisit it with this lens, mm -hmm. but I you know I'm I, I'm sort of so I'm sort of grateful, but at the same time it kind of gave me permission retroactively to feel these things. Mm -hmm. If that makes how's that for the soundbite? There's the it, sound. <laughs> it makes fantastic sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry for the little cameo that that fish was. Is that your cat? Yeah, he, my cat. My cat's somewhere over here. They won't come. The only time he wants to have anything to do with me is when I do the podcast. And he's always like, oh, what's going on? And your hand, when you're going like this, he was 
watching your hands on the on the screen. <laughs> I was like, oh gosh, Woo. he's gonna go for it. <laughs> that would have been awesome, and we would have had a shit a clip. It's <laughs> amazing. And what was it? You mentioned that while you were writing, and since the books come out, and you've you know done events, and people have shared their their stories and their experiences with you. What is what has it been like for you to to get that feedback and know that basically everyone when they're going through you know middle school or high school like we're, we all went through the same thing just very degrees of it. Uh, it's been it, it's been great in that I you know sense of connection, but also I think less when I was writing it more I, I sort of I pulled back on the whole oh I'm the only one because I went through this and, and, and it forced me to look, to write it with more of a self-awareness. It forced me to write it from, I guess you're always, when you're writing about your, your past, you're always looking at it with this lens, but it, it made me be, force myself to be self-aware because I realized, oh, you're not the only one. Like you can't just, you know, you're not the only immigrant that's come out here that's been, you know, felt like an outsider or, or picked on, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so largely been positive, largely been, I just, I, it, it really, I'm really interested in hearing people's stories. Like I love, you know, the whole Switzerland thing. It's just, it's fascinating. And, um, and Diana, the fact that you're, you kept, you know, you had to visit your, see you guys either came to California or originated in California. And that was my dream. <laughs> I wanted, I like dreamed about living in California. I, I used to watch um, Eight is Enough when I was a kid. And even though I said in Sacramento, I always felt like that was, you know, I guess it was shot in LA, but I was like, one day I'm going to be in LA. And, and I had no idea yeah. no plans of what I was going to do, but I was like, LA, LA, California, that's the, that's the place. Same so. thing yeah. for me. Yeah. Cause it was, it was my dad. It was my dad who came out to LA. It was um, my mother and my dad when I was a kid. And sorry, I'm getting an echo here. And then, um, when I was really little, they got divorced, my mother went back to New York. And then when I was, you know, I got old enough to fly by myself every summer, every summer and some Christmases, I was out here in California. And that was mm -hmm. pretty much it. Once that happened, yeah. um, by the time I graduated high school, I spent a year in New York because it was, it's still kind of, it's a scary thing to leave anywhere that you know right whether it's you know from one country to another or if it's um from one even one state to another i went i was 17 years old i moved from new york with nothing but a suitcase and a guitar and moved in with my dad and my stepmom and they had my brother and sister were barely toddlers uh, or just over toddler i think my brother uh -huh. was maybe two or three and my sister was five years old so my, my parents had these two really little kids and this rebellious <laughs> 17, almost 18 year old that moved in. Mm -hmm. And that was all kinds of craziness, but it was still really scary. Even the thought of doing it, the plan was to always go out there because I was a Saved by the Bell girl. I watched Saved by the Bell. <laughs> yep, I'm yep. in LA and mm -hmm. I'm gonna be Kelly Kapowski. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> and yeah. and. That after high school, I had this momentary panic of, oh my God, I'm going to leave everything here. Can I really do this? Should I really do this? And I stayed there for a year, got into some trouble, and then ended up in California anyway, because mm -hmm. that was the decision I needed to make. But yeah, just it's scary. And that's one of the things I love about immigrant stories in general, whether it's you know a memoir like yours, which is great. I love reading the, these kinds of memoirs or the fiction, like I just finished Etaf Rum's um, A Woman Is No Man. Oh, I wanna, I wanna read that, oh my God. Oh my God. I'm dying to read that. Oh, you got yeah? it. Yeah, yeah, okay. okay. On the show next month. Oh, really cool. Was, it was a tearjerker, Michelle was getting texts from me. <laughs> oh my God, oh my God, this book, I can't even with this book, because um, it was just such a very gritty, honest look at what it's like for women to mm -hmm. be immigrants. Right. And from a very different culture and even holding on to your culture, whether, because I mean, even in the States, we had different cultures from state to state. Sure. Yeah. And holding on to that culture. So yeah, I love these yeah. kinds of books. See, I even over answer questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, and that's the thing, like when I was writing, somebody asked me, you know, when I was writing it, I kind of, I felt like, well, it, you know, my, my story isn't a tearjerker. Nothing really horrible happened. I mean, I had some small things that were weird that happened, but whatever, who hasn't? I mean, I guess mine are 
weirder than usual for mm -hmm. that, for, you know, what I'm referring to the early chapters. But, um, but I just, I felt like who's going to really care? I mean, that was, I think originally when I was writing it, I, you know, downplayed it because I thought it's, it's not, I need to be, have an epic story. And as I was writing it and, 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 you know, once we went through the second draft uh, of of it, I think I pulled back some of the comedy. I was being a little too com, you know, bearing it with, again, doing that whole thing that I did when I was a kid. Oh, they can't hate it because it's going to be funny, and at least they'll find it interesting. And I thought, okay, we got to strip that away and just tell the story. And you know, I'm so glad I did because I just, it's just the story I told. You know, that's just my story, and you know, it's not everybody's story. It's one immigrant story, and hopefully, I had you know pulled enough of a, a through line to it to to find for people to find it interesting. But but so far, people has the pos the um, response has been positive. But yeah, I think I was that's the whole thing. I was insecure about writing a memoir because to me, memoir meant something epic had ha had mm -hmm. to happen. You know what I mean? But uh, I had it. You know, you, you said you mentioned something about. Um, well, your story, Diana, the, leaving with a guitar, <laughs> that's like, that right there is a book. I mean, to me, that's like, that's so cool. That's just so like, you know, I don't know, like traveling woman, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> I mean, I came to California, but the only way I could do it was to get, you know, I was too afraid to come out. I was like, I'm going to go to film school and come in under the guise of, you know, protected, you know, school, whatever. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I mean, I ended up in school, too, because it was one of those, um, you know, I got, came out here and my parents were like, okay, what college? And <laughs> went to, I did the community college thing before because my grades weren't the best. Um, so I did the community college thing for a few years and then worked at Disneyland. Ooh. And, you know, got my, yeah, not as glamorous as it sounds. But <laughs> at the LA Times Festival, remind me, I will tell you stories of how okay. glamorous that life is. We didn't clean toilets, did you? No, Make I didn't work in stores, which is almost as bad as oh, no. Disneyland. <laughs> um, especially, my heart goes out to anybody listening who works um, the Emporium on Main Street on a busy night, um, or Space Traders on New Year's Eve. <laughs> <laughs> So, all, all the war stories, right? Oh God, they're they're almost as bad as our telemarketing stories. Yeah, yeah, the, we had some good ones. You guys were See, both telemarketers at one point. Uh, we um we met by working at a timeshare travel agency. Oh, so we we didn't we weren't sales, but we worked in a call center. So we had like the awesome, cool mm -hmm. headsets, um, and and we booked you know travel uh, reservations. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's that's how we met, and we would trade books to read over our cubicles. Okay. What to read when we weren't getting phone calls? Because we were fabulous employees. Well, I mean, we were we were selected to work at an offsite location because we were such good workers, but there was no supervision there. So as long as we did our job, <laughs> barely, um, in some of my cases. <laughs> But, but I remember, you know, you're talking about, you know, wanting to move to California because, you know, of, of all the things that you'd read about and you see in movies and everything. When I was getting close to, to high school age in, in Switzerland, um, they don't have high school the way that Calif or that um, America has high school. And I started saying, you know, I want to go back because I wanted a locker. That was like <laughs> right, right. my one thing. I was like, I want a locker. I want to be able to like hang pictures up on it and slam it <laughs> shut when I'm having a fight with my best friend or whatever. <laughs> and it's really funny, like the priorities that you have as a teenager, like what's important to you. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, lockers are important. I mean, that's like your idea. Isn't that kind of you're carving out your identity and that's sort of the first Maybe I mean, know. we probably could make like a, a legitimate literary symbolism out of what a locker means. Or what your life is going to end up like, because my <laughs> locker was a mess. <laughs> ooh, that's, a, ooh and, that, that's cool right there, yeah. <laughs> and ironically, once I had, 
once I got the locker, I never used it. I was like, it was all the way on the other side of campus. I didn't have time to go back in between classes. So it became like a storage for stuff I didn't feel like carting back home. That's hilarious. But I had well, it. Exactly. Yeah, you had it if you wanted to. You could put that picture of right. uh, Jesse from Full House or Uncle Jesse or whatever. Whoever. <laughs> <laughs> for me, it was, George, it was George Michael. I had it, my Trapper Keeper. Uh, oh, man, Trapper Keepers. Yep. Uh, remember Trapper Keepers. Mark Paul Gosling from Saved by the Bell. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I was a Saved by the Bell nerd. Yep. <laughs> oh, no, for me, it was uh, Jonathan Taylor Thomas from Home Improvement. <laughs> <laughs> and whatever other teeny bopper movies he was in at the time. He was too young for me. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I think yeah, too young for me as well. I'm trying to think. I'm sure I had. I don't know. I saw this thing on Facebook a while ago that was like, if your high school crush, your middle, you know, uh, junior high crush had the mushroom haircut. <laughs> <laughs> like you, it's, it's time for you to start using night cream it's like oh my god it's true <laughs> or the mullet that was the thing oh, oh man yeah. or the rat tails the guys would have i don't know uh, if it was just in new york yes. they had, like, those no rats. yeah they were disgusting i'm sorry <laughs> yes, so gross yeah, <laughs> wait so didn't bad. um uh from saved by the bell didn't he have one um slater yeah did he yeah. have one I think he did. I think it won't a little bit. He did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Slater, I was uh, at that time. I, I have a tendency to go for the geeky. Goofy yeah. Kind of oh, guy. yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah. So he was too macho for me. Right. I think that was my, my thing. I was more yeah. the comedy. Mark, Mark, Mark Paul Gosler, Zach Morris. Right. Was my, my guy. Just because he was so goofy and com comedic. Mm -hmm. At least you didn't say Screech. <laughs> not right. that geeky no, <laughs> there is a line <laughs> now one thing i've noticed for me being at least from california going somewhere else or even when i've traveled internationally there's this idea of what americans are like um outside of the u.s um like for example, like my parents were in France one time, and we love. It's a story that we love, and I, I absolutely love. Uh, they were talking on a subway, and and one of the Frenchmen were like, "So you're from the U.S.?" And they're like, "Oh yeah, yeah." And the his friend, I guess, made a face or something, and he asked my parents where they were from, and they said California, of course. And he looked at his uh, friend, and he's like, "It's okay. They're okay. They're cool. They're from California." <laughs> <laughs> Now, for you, Acer, is was there any of that when, like, you went back to Saudi Arabia, or where there were certain ideas of what American life was like? Sorry, my dog's tingling up my headphones. Oh, <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I think in Saudi Arabia, yeah, that was the thing. It was like uh, they thought when I first went to Saudi Arabia, coming from Kentucky. But, you know, the whole America thing, they were like, oh, did you know Olivia Newton-John? Do you know Olivia Newton-John? Like, no, I was just in Kentucky. I didn't know Olivia Newton-John. But, um, but, yeah, it's that whole thing. Like, it's so – it's the country any, – any place is huge, but the media makes it look small. So every place is is California. Every place mm -hmm. is whatever. Um, and so, so, yeah, I think I felt I felt that. Um, it, was, it was interesting because – Everything was pretty American centric, and we we there was a lot of Brit like we would have the British products that would you know that come to the grocery stores. And at the time, no, I'm sorry, everything was sorry, everything was British centric because it was closer. Mm -hmm. And all I want, like I wanted a Dr Pepper. I mean, I didn't think that was the thing, and um, we couldn't get couldn't get them. And there were all these like British products that at the time I I did not appreciate. And now I'm a huge Anglophile. I love British stuff, but it's just so funny that we were like, oh, you know, like lip smackers was it was a big thing that it was hard to get. You can only find it at this. You had to go to this store, like you know, in town. It was like the Walmart of Saudi Arabia. Um, you couldn't get it at the at the local grocery stores, but. Um, but yeah, it was like all these like random weird products that now we're getting and we're thinking that they're exotic. But back then I was like, oh God, I just want to, I just want an American thing, you know? <laughs> I would have my friends mail me 
like the giant Costco sized boxes of Oreos. Yeah, Oreos. Oreos were really <laughs> <food>. yeah. <laughs> and my mom would have them do the same for Cheez Its. And we would hide them from each other in the house, like, <laughs> and dole them out secretly before with no one watching. So no one could steal our stash. Yeah. <laughs> I know. It's the, the things. Yeah, we had, I for some reason, Kit Kats, we would buy in bulk. I had a lot of Kit Kats when I was 14. <laughs> I would buy and eat them, like, yeah, three at a time. But yeah, they did. we didn't have cheeses, but we had something called, like, cheese balls. And I think it was planters or something. But yeah, it was always, we just wanted Doritos. All we wanted was Doritos and Pizza Hut and, you know, all McDonald's. They didn't have McDonald's back then for political reasons. But um, when we were there in the 80s. But yeah, it was it was interesting. It was a weird time because it was like for me, you know, I was coming from Kentucky. I was sort of still not settled in. And then going to Saudi Arabia, which was this weird culture clash, everything that you would ever expect it to be back then. But I felt a little bit more I fit in more because I was people were like me. You know, they were like, "Oh, half, you know, half Arabic and half American or, you know, like me that I, Arabs that had grown up in the States or England. And um, so it was this is strange thing where I felt like at least I belonged to this little tribe, but yet we, we banded together also because we didn't want to be there, you know? So it was this, it was just like a lot of, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm really looking back. I'm really grateful for all of my experiences, but at the time I just want, you know, you just, you just want to be in one place. You don't want to move around. All we did was move around. Every year we moved around, it seemed like, and always in the middle of winter, you know, it was, just, it was annoying. So I can imagine, yeah. I mean, just moving as a kid is just that's it's life changing. <laughs> yeah. I know you make or, your friend. Yeah. Or life ending if you're the dramatic type. I don't know these dramatic types, but I hear no. they exist. Yeah, neither of none of us know them, right? Mm -mm. No. no. You're not raising one, Michelle, not at all. <laughs> no, no, my daughter definitely is not dramatic. <laughs> How old is she? She she thinks she's 16. She's five. Oh. Okay. You mean she wants but, to get into a car and drive? Or what do you mean? Do you think she I mean, she this girl has you know, tonight I, I told her, you know, you have to clean up your toys because you know it's dinner time, and then we have time to get ready for bed. I'm so tired. I can't pick up my toys. <laughs> well, you took them out, so you have to put them away. But my legs hurt. I can't walk. And then finally, you know, my last resort with her is, well, I'm going to call the trash man, and he's going to come take all your toys away if you don't put them away. And usually that'll get her going. But now she just goes, fine. <laughs> oh my gosh, woman. <laughs> like, if you think this is bad, just wait. <laughs> it gets worse. You'll, you'll have teachers that, that won't care about your feelings. <laughs> yeah, and, and get, it gets better thing for her. It's just gonna go the opposite way. I, yeah, I, I look forward to the parent teacher meetings. <laughs> really? She said that. I am not surprised. <laughs> that sounds like her. Well, but my, oh, I'm sorry, last call. My, my whole thing, you know, you said moving as, you know, moving all the time was a pain in the neck. And it really was because we moved several times and I was always the new girl and I hated being the new girl. Yeah. Um, and my thing with my kids now, I mean, we're in the, my husband's in the military, so we move, but there, my kids are only going to move twice. Um, we've already moved once, and we'll move one more time, and then he's done. But my thing is, they are going to go to the same school for as long as possible. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's great. So, but yeah, I can, I remember moving and finding out, oh, I'm going to go to this school. Okay. Let's see, see what these people are like. Mm -hmm. But did, did you feel like it, did it feel like you, it made you more outgoing or did it make you kind of shrink? Cause for me, I shrunk. I'm, I'm actually a very shy person by nature. You, you wouldn't, I see that face, Diana. I, um, <laughs> um, I'm very shy. I'm very um, introverted, but 
moving all the time forced me to pretend like I'm outgoing right. when I am not. Right. So it taught me to to put myself out of my comfort zone when really I just wanted to like go home and read a book and yeah. not talk to anyone. So I'm grateful for that because it helped me later in life. But but yeah, I I would have been like the the keep to myself one if mm -hmm. I, if I'd had my way. Right. But that's, you know, that's what happens. <laughs> <laughs> and so you said that that was a kind of experience that made you kind of shrink in a little bit. And... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I, um, when I was, you know, I, apparently I was an outgoing young child and we, you know, we moved when I was four. So before that I was just like almost a bruiser. I remember my mom would say that I would just like, push kids out of the way. So it's probably for the best. <laughs> What's an obnoxious, you know, like child. That's so, that's so annoying. Um, but when I came here to the States, I just, yeah, it was, I couldn't, you know, I didn't know how to speak the language. English was not, Arabic was my first language. I didn't know how to pronounce words. I couldn't say my R's. I just shrunk up and I was this weird kid. And you know, my parents were also trying to fit in. So I just, I just wanted to be small. I just wanted to be like everyone else. I would tell people that my name was Lisa. For some reason, people couldn't pronounce Acer. And so I said, oh, well, just call me Lisa. And what, so we started in Ohio and then moved to Kentucky. And again, like, I think, I think my parents might've had a little part to play in this because we were from Iraq. This was the eighties or no, sorry. 70s. It was the 70s, like mid 70s, and so the Iran Contra crisis, uh, hostage crisis, was, was mm -hmm. going on, and so my parents were like, "Don't say you don't tell people where you're you're from Iraq because they're going to think it's Iran," and you know what? So I was confused. They were like, "Where are you from?" And I'm like, "Ohio," and they're like, "You're not. You're lying." What, what is that? <laughs> no, I'm from Ohio. I mean, you know, nowadays I could be like, huh, "How dare you? Stop, you know, microaggressing me." But um, <laughs> yeah, so it was just, it was just, I just. I think, yeah, it was the the period for Ohio. I was such a scare. I, everything scared me. Maybe that's why I didn't have such a good time there. Kentucky was a little bit better. We moved to Saudi Arabia and then came back. And at that point, I had a taste of when we, when we moved to Saudi Arabia. I then was able to come into my own. And I I call it. There's a term we used in the '80s called spaz. So it was just such a spaz. I was just like great, you know, prepubescent and it didn't matter because there were no boys around. There was nothing, I, you know, we were just in this bubble of innocence and just could do whatever I wanted. And it was, you know, a di it was such a change from where I was before. And so it was nice to have that because then you're, you're like, okay, so it's not just me. There are people that accept me. And so then when we moved to America, I was really happy to be out of Saudi Arabia, but it was this weird acclimation, you know, that, I think in my head, I thought I was going to be homecoming queen and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> I said I was the furthest thing from that. <laughs> Do you remember um, what I'm curious to know what it's like for someone to learn English who has no knowledge of the English language? Because I learned you know, German and Italian, but those languages make sense to me. Like there is um, structure and... Yeah everything follows a formula and, and I feel like English is just like, this is how it is. You have to learn it. There's no trick. <laughs> you know, I don't remember. I just remember, um, I honestly do not remember. I just remember feeling weird. I remember going to speech therapy class. Cause I, like I said, I couldn't say my R's. I would say, Oh, I think I just, it wasn't, it was maybe less being an immigrant and more that I just couldn't say them. So they, they would tell you to, put your tongue to the top of your, the roof of your mouth and say, er, 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 every two, I think it was like two days a week was like Monday, Wednesday or something from three to three fifteen, I'd have to go and do error. Er. But it was, um, yeah, it was, it was, I think it was more that I was, my mother and I were learning and my mother had a strong accent. And so, she, so I would say words the way she would say them. So I had a, a line in the school play <laughs> In second grade, we were doing like something about the pilgrims or the settlers or whatever. And my line was, we'll bring them iron and ore or something like that. But, you know, very- Let's throw as many R's in there yeah, as possible. Exactly. <laughs> and I would say, and so I said, and they'll bring them iron 
And the teacher's like, iron. And I'm like, yes, I know iron. Because my mother would say iron for some, you know, that's how she pronounced it. And it was just, you know, I would say like my daddy, you know, like, like almost British, but like my dad would say your daddy. And they're like, what's daddy? And I'm like, no, daddy, fine, daddy. Just, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. It was just, I took everything so seriously that it was just, you know, I... That would be my one regret is just going back and maybe chilling out a little bit. I was, so, <laughs> was so scared of everything. Everything was like, ah, <laughs> you know. Yeah, the, the whole accent thing, I, I totally hear you on that. Coming from New York and I'd come out here and I had like this whole <laughs> group of friends and they'd yeah. be like, I, I felt like a train monkey because they'd be like, say car. <laughs> <laughs> and like, say wash the car. <laughs> And so, like, I remember when I moved out here, I got so tired of it that I think I watched a lot of, started watching a lot of British TV and <laughs> the, way, the ways that people talk out here. So I kind of have a pseudo Canadian slash Valley kind of way that I talk mm -hmm. so that I don't sound like I'm a New Yorker. Like, my mother always makes fun of me whenever um, we get together, whenever I talk to her, if I say words like button or pocket. Because I don't say pocket like they say it. Uh -huh. I don't, I don't, because if I emphasize, if I say pocket, it's, do you hear the New York in there? And so I learned, I taught myself to say pocket. But pocket. There's a, like, it's like AU. What's button then? But uh, it was, um, is it button? You know, I'm not sure. Maybe it's, maybe it is button. That was one of the things that she made fun of me of, and I can't remember exactly what it was, but pocket was a big one. Huh. Oh, I have to say pocket. Pocket. <laughs> I won't That's say pocket. so cute. That's the cutest. <laughs> I, I went through a phase, I, it, because I you know, didn't have enough of a weird identity crisis, I decided when I was 12 and we were living in Saudi Arabia that I was going to start saying orange. Orange. And my brother's like, what are you doing? It was like orange. And like everything it was an orange because I, I don't know why. I didn't even know. What region is that from? That's is that that's, that's New York, okay. New Jersey. Yeah. I didn't even know what that was. I was, I was maybe because I saw it on TV. I'm like orange, and he's like, "What are you doing?" And I, I think I his his name is Zade, and I decided to call him Dave. Because, <laughs> yeah, like I, I clearly had no identity. Like I was at a crisis of everything. So yeah, it just whatever. <laughs> that's I wanted to be like, orange. Yeah, orange. Yeah. That's my, my mom's from New Jersey. I'm from New Jersey too, but um, we moved to California when I was little. So I have the California accent and my mom has the New Jersey accent. I say orange and everyone in my family says orange. And they're all like, why do you say orange? It's ah, it's an O, oh, it's an ah oh sound. <laughs> so no, cute. but it's O-R, it's or. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, These no, are the debates you have after yeah. like three glasses of wine and the whole family's together. Exactly. Do you speak, so you guys speak, you said Italian and German. Do you speak that in the family? Like do you curse each other out? No, um, my mom, my mom and I speak Italian when we don't want other people to know what we're saying. Mm -hmm. um, now it's handy for presents for the kids if we wow. don't want them to hear what we're saying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but no, we all speak English at home. Um, I could speak Italian if it was very, very important. I could get my point across. Mm -hmm. um, but it would probably, at this point, it would probably be not grammatically correct. Right. But I know if I went back there, it would come back right, right. away yeah. um, if, I, uh, if I kind of immersed myself in it. Mm -hmm. um, for, yeah, and for me, when it comes to the Italian language, I'm going back trying to learn it now. Because I come from, my great grandparents were immigrants. Yeah. And for me, by the time I came along, the only words I learned in Italian were the swear words. Because, Those are the important ones. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Those are the ones that count. Yeah. Because when, when Uncle Mario started cursing, that's when all of the cousins would take off running. Um, <laughs> that's, when, that's when we knew we were in trouble. We were, we were, being, we were doing something wrong. Um, you know, I still remember him when he would get mad at my aunt, and I remember um, the the phrase "I Mona," and I he would say that to her whenever she frustrate him. He'd be like "I Mona" and like storm mm -hmm. off. Is her name her. Mona, or is that a, a word? Judy. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> Mona, and I, 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 I feel like Mona probably means bitch or god woman. I think. <laughs> I think, could it be Madonna? Because that's what they say. Ay, Madonna. It's like, oh my gosh. And they have the hand movement. This is a big hand movement yeah, in, yeah. in Italian. Yeah. <laughs> that was one. I still have that one. Um, maybe. Because I, you guys, I mean, that was, you guys probably spoke dialect. So, yeah, and I spoke. Yeah, because moved here. My Uncle Mario moved here when he was a teenager. Probably, I, I speak like the proper Italian. Mm. Um, although, not to offend any Italian who doesn't speak, you know, the Italian that I teach in school, mm -hmm. not the, the dialects. Yeah, he was from the um, northern border over by where Yugoslavia. Oh, uh, okay. Over there, so he spoke that region's dialect. And then the rest of my so. family is southern. We're Calabrian and Sicily. Sicilian, so mm -hmm. very passionate. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, see, that's the thing. I people knew about Italy. There were movies made about Italy, and there were Italians. There were gangsters, and they were doing cool things. Yeah. And, you know, I just wish I'm like, okay, hey, I could say I talk with our hands. I, you know, I was like, why can't I just be Italian? I really, when I was younger, if not for the fact that my me and my brothers and si my brother and sister are spitting images of my parents. I was like, maybe I was adopted. Maybe there's something more. Maybe, you know, I could be different. I just don't want to be. Ah, my parents are from the same town. Like they're my dad's from Baghdad and my mom's from Basra. And they were, you know, he was she was his student. And ah, oh, it's so boring. But then it turned out that there was some Iranian in her blood, and so then I was like, okay, cool, that's different, you know. But in high school, they, you know, they, we had to do the genealogy, and and they're like, well, where are you from? Arabic. And everybody was like, I'm part in, in British, and I'm part this. And again, like these are like people. It's funny because people now are like, oh, that's so exotic. But back then, I was like, I just want to be British. I just want to be, you know, Italian or something that people know. So many <laughs> uh, exactly, um, I did. Still, with the Italian um, culture thing, that the, what you see in the movies and media isn't really. I know, necessary. I know. Yeah, no, I'm being, no, I'm being no, a no, jerk. No, yeah. yeah, I'm yeah. being, I'm being very uh, yeah, general. Okay. Yeah, I'm like. Yeah, I totally get where you're coming from. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know. I saw Goodfellas, and I'm like, hey, I want to be. Listeners <laughs> <laughs> gonna be like, what the hell? Well, listen, you know, compared to the people, my, you know, people were being represented with like. It was, uh, uh, you know, Lawrence of Arabia, and that was it, right? At the time, I mean, then it well, or it was like then you guys end up graduating to become the terrorists within the right. media. So you guys got to be the bad right. guys. Naked Gun, or no? Yeah. What was it? Uh, what's the one where? Uh, not the Naked Gun series, but the other one where the guys like I'm going. He's like supposed to be Saddam Hussein. He's like I'm going to kill you until you die from it. So that was like that kind of stuff, you know. <laughs> yeah. So it was like. And yeah. this has got to be frustrating. I mean, I know I get frustrated with <laughs> the mafia stuff. Yeah. Um, I can only imagine being frustrated having your your culture represented only as terrorists. You know, and it, again, embarrassingly, because of that whole like not you know not feeling that it was okay to not feel that way mm -hmm. up until a few years ago. Um, when we were growing up, it was like, oh, okay, that I guess this is what's happening. This is this is how we're. Oh, that's just that's not all of us Arabs, but I guess you know whatever it sells movies. Like we were just we were gonna go with it. And that's why I'm saying like right now is a great time because everybody's like, no, 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 no. You know, you're, we're not gonna, it was just, you know, it just gives you this permission, which is embarrassing that I needed that external thing to, to have permission. But that's, you know, for me, it was all about fitting in. So yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't frustrating when I was younger. I think just cause I was like, oh, look, <laughs> just look, I'm up there. You know, I'm, 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 this is where I'm from, you know, cause before like, we don't know where Iraq is and then, you know, Iraq war. I'm like, oh, look here, you know, this is where I'm from. I sh don't hold it against me. Um, so yeah, it's just, I don't know. It's weird. It's all, you know, it's all weird and complicated and it's just, you know, it's cool to talk to people because it turns out everybody's got weird and complicated stuff. Mm -hmm. So that was the biggest thing that I learned for me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I love the fact that we're in this time now, even with America, that even though we've got this other very xenophobic stuff going on we mm. still have this kind of salad mentality you know when i was a kid growing up in history class it was all about the melting pot and everybody just melting in and becoming this oh, that's cool. standard american um being and then by the time i got to college they start talking about the salad we're just this one big old salad um with 
all these different cultures and we still get to be one great dish, but there's lots of different flavors in that dish. Mm -hmm. and they're distinct flavors. And, you know, I love stories like yours and stuff because it reminds us that our diversity is what brings us together. Well, thank you. I love that salad analogy. That's, and it's healthier too. It is. It is. <laughs> <laughs> and you can feel free to use that. I, I, I won't trademark it or anything. Okay. Oh, is it yours? <laughs> No. I, no, I'm going to have to give you credit. If it's yours, I'm going to give you credit, if obviously. It's actually a sociological term. It was one of the few things that stuck with me from my sociology degree. Mm -hmm. yeah, so. yeah. But we've actually well, kept you for the full hour. Oh, my gosh. I've kept you from your uh, your other book. That's okay, because we've been having a really great discussion. And <laughs> I, didn't want, yeah, I didn't want to just let you go, so we <laughs> But I, I don't know if you have anything going on between now and the book festival for events where people can find you. Because I know they can find you on social media and you've got that great animal campaign where people are talking <laughs> about animals. And I can get my copy of your book at book or else that you could see pictures of my menagerie with your book. How many, you, how many do you have? Yes, yes. I've got two dogs and then I've got a tort two tortoises. You have two turtles? Did yeah. you see the picture of the turtle? I my did. <laughs> And I was like, oh, my turtle's way bigger. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a one-off. I didn't realize this was a whole thing with, tur with, the, with turtles. That's so great. Yeah, and yeah. then I also have a bearded dragon and some snakes. So Wait, what? We have, I have a bearded dragon. What's that? Like a lizard? Like a Komodo yeah, it's thing? It's a lizard. Okay. There's pictures at the, at the okay. festival. Yeah, it's it's from Australia, and she's wow. a really cool little okay. critter. Um, she's welcome. Yes, I you know I'm the equal opportunity animal book <laughs> person. Um, but wait, are you, are you asked me a question. What did you? <laughs> yeah, uh, event wise, besides finding you on uh, Instagram and Twitter, um, are you going to be making other, any other appearances before the book festival? Yes. Are you, is this local or is this a we are actually nation okay. international? Really? Oh, cool. Yeah. Well, I'm going to be on uh, March 28th. I'm going to book people in Austin, Texas. And then the following week, I'm going to be in Lexington, Kentucky, which is my hometown. And I'm going to the Carnegie Center uh, for Literacy on the 4th of April in Lexington. Um, if you follow me on Instagram, all of that information is is there. And I think that's the, those are the only major appearances I have until the 13th, right, is when the, the Festival of Books. Yep, and I'm, you're going to be there from 2 to 4 at the Women's National Book Associations. Oh, cool. Both days, right? Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I let me write that down. <laughs> um, yeah, I met I met another uh, writer, Huda, or I actually Huda, the one that connected, uh, that brought the um, the news crew in, mm -hmm. and I just got her. I, I've been reading her. I've been listening to her book, and I was like, just realized, yeah, you know, I, I realized it wasn't her that was um, narrating it. So I just I just bought the book, so I'm going to read it. Mm -hmm. um, she said she was going to be there. I think. Yeah, she's going to be there the two hours before you get there. Okay. On Saturday. So I try to get there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So and that's you cool. guys feel yeah. free to like Facebook Live me again this year so I can hang out. Oh, we totally are. We're gonna be doing <laughs> Facebook Lives. Um yeah, the podcast is gonna be all over the place on there. We're yeah. gonna do a little interviews, uh, Facebook Lives again. Um and basically this year just camping out at the <laughs> yeah. people and I am gonna be living there all weekend. Um so everybody feel free to come by and say hello to us and yeah, we'll be Facebook living and just all over the social media. Stuff. Yeah, I'm super excited. I've never, I've only been as a participant. I mean, obviously, but uh, it's it's huge, and so I'm honored to be part of it with you guys. Yeah, yeah, it's like I call it the Disneyland for bookworms. But yeah. minus, hopefully, minus the the experience that you had when you worked it. Yeah, yeah, that's just their hangout thing, and that's just fun because you know obviously naturally talkative so i just sit there with like a camera and you know my and stuff in a microphone and i'm like hey yeah. how's it going and just like watching whatever random goofing off we end up doing while we're there um oh really there's a micro you just have a microphone and you're like a, a carnival barker step right up <laughs> um, almost, but like uh, we'll be sitting behind the table and i'll be interviewing you from the table we'll be doing the live um oh fun interview. Yeah. Very cool. I didn't. Oh, wow. Yeah. We'll be Super. hanging out doing that kind of stuff. Yeah. Last year when I was doing it, I was hanging out at Black Chateau's booth and we had the horror 
writers come in and invade us while we were there and just uh -huh. like come in and just take over uh the live stream and we had this i don't even know what we were talking about it was just like this goofy um discussion because after a while while you're there you're just like you just goof off and talk and mm -hmm. bullshit the whole time yeah yeah <laughs> that's awesome that's the best yeah. that's so yeah, cool so I'm super, well, you know what, you guys, this is the coolest thing that you're doing. I love this podcast and thank you for inviting me oh, thank and you. Uh, being part of this group. It's so, it's so great. It's just, I've made me feel so welcome and you guys are awesome. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Of the Wine, Women and Words family. Um, we're almost mafia-esque, not quite. We won't <laughs> do any hits or anything. Um, <laughs> come by anytime you want and uh, just give us a shout out and let us know and we'll have you back on. So we'd love to have you come back and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure, thanks. Thanks. <laughs> so everyone keep reading uh, all, um, I almost combined two titles of two different books into one. Um, and I had a little glass of wine. <laughs> um, keep reading, learning to see, um, we will talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> 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 and uh come back next thursday yes. uh, and next thursday we have who do we have we have mary atkins on the show next thursday yeah i'm excited about that <laughs> yes yes i can't wait she's got um, a very fast unique book um, mm. which is i forget when you read this is what it's called and it's written all in emails and blog posts oh yes. that's cool it's re it was it's oh, really fun to read mm -hmm. and it's a fast read i read it in um i read it in a week and Michelle i read it in a day which doesn't happen very often wow that's so it's, it's it's really it's really unique just you know i love books that change, play with fonts mm -hmm. and then do different layouts sometimes to kind of break up the the pages and that's what this book does the entire way through wow um so i thought it was really fun to read that sounds fun i'm gonna put that on my list <laughs> yeah. and then if you guys aren't following us already on face on instagram follow us on instagram because we're gonna have a giveaway coming up um we've got an extra copy of when you read this the, a hardback copy that we're going to be giving it oh, cool so guys be sure to check it out and join us at the at acers um events i You've got that stuff on your website too, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, if I don't, <laughs> yes, I'm going. Yes, I'm going to put them on. I I, we'll have we'll have links to it either for <laughs> username for Instagram because I know it's on there. Or we'll have the uh, links to our website so you guys can check it out in the show notes. Um, or just join us at the um, LA Festival of Books. And so we'll see you guys there. And see you later. Bye, cool. guys. Thank you. Have a good Bye. night. Bye. Thank you.